Okay, now we're on to Chapter 3C, Freemasonry. <clears throat> and right off the bat here, before I forget it, I'm going to put a link in the uh, as an annotation in the video here to another video by the Alien Fossil Project, uh, used to be uh, Humans Win channel, where he caught some footage or, you know, came across some footage of Chunky Mark, Luke Radowski, Alex Jones, and Max Kaiser, and he's calling it uh, a Schilderberg Fringe Fest. And uh, they're doing Masonic handshakes, or at least there's there's one, obviously one, uh, captured there. And then I'm also going <clears> to <throat> include some footage here of uh, Gordon Brown from several years ago, just about knocking people down in, in a crowd in a, in a room um, to uh, shake hands with a evidently a very important person in the crowd uh, the way he's acting and um, and you'll see okay so let's just get right into it a great deal of deception regarding the origins of Freemasonry and its role in the world stage today has intentionally been manufactured lately in an attempt to buy the great plan controlled mainstream media to cloud the waters of truth you now know the real truth of the origin of Freemasonry, but let's expand on your newly gained knowledge. Freemasonry today at its lower level is more of a good old boys network geared toward advancing the careers of fellow Freemasons through business contacts with other Freemasons. It has nothing to do whatsoever with blue collar stone workers and everything to do with white collar businessmen looking to join the Brotherhood to gain insider contacts to further their careers. The proponents of the Great Plan use the upper levels of Freemasonry to pull the strings from behind the scenes of our national governments, international banks, and multinational corporations. This is because Freemasonry at its upper, upper echelon of degrees is the primary modern-day housing of the ancient Babylonian mystery religion secondarily resting with the upper echelon of the unholy Roman Empire. It is only the upper 1% or less of all Freemasons that know what the true intent of, the, of their organization historically was and is. The multitudes of lower rank and file Masons, mostly Blue Lodge Masons, have no idea. They are being used as pawns to help set up a one world government. The proponents of the Great Plan rarely, if ever, recruit from the lower levels of Freemasonry. All of their upper echelon minions consist of the various bloodline families who have always been involved with the Luciferian secret societies and those rogue independent personalities who have proven themselves highly valuable to their agenda. Point of fact, nearly all Freemasons are in fact honorable men who believe their organization is for good and wholesome causes. At least this is what they are coerced to think. This harkens back to both the Knights Templar and the Rosicrucians putting up a diabolical facade to fool people into believing they are only to get dedicated to good deeds and to question them is nonsensical when in fact a great deception has taken place yet again. There is also a direct connection I want to immediately reveal between fr Freemasonry and the ancient Babylonian mystery religion and that is the fact that Freemasonry regards King Nimrod as the first Freemason for his quote masonry prowess unquote he employed in undertaking the construction of the Tower of Babel. This is a carefully planted deception trying to hide the true nature of Nimrod's significance within Freemasonry. This is also an implica implication of King Nimrod as the head architect of the great plan. For if you tie all of the symbolism involved in Freemasonry, such as the hexagram, the all-seeing eye, the obelisk, and on and on, it all goes back to Nimrod and the occult Babylonian mystery religion. I would say that the varying quotes of the Freemasonic prophets we will go over, fully admitting Lucifer is the god of the Freemasons, should convince you of the true evil intent of the people running the Freemasonic great plan and their goal of a Luciferian one world government exactly as stated in the Bible. 
As recently as the spring 2006 issue of Freemasonry Today, a sanctified Masonic publication, we are publicly told that King Nimrod, not King Solomon, was the first head of Freemasonry. Quote, the universal sentiment of the Freemasons of the present day is to confer upon Solomon, the King of Israel, the honor of being their first Grand Master. But the legend of the craft had long before, though there was a tradition of the temple in existence given, at least by suggestion, that title to Nimrod, the King of Babylonia and Assyria. It had credited the first organization of the Fraternity of Craftsmen to him in saying that he gave a charge to the workmen whom he, whom he sent to assist the king of Nineveh in building his cities." Unquote. Do you see the deception on the part of Freemasonry today to imply that it is Nimrod who first organized a fraternity of stone workers that gives him his status within Freemasonry? Not only is Nimrod considered to be the first Freemason and Masonic leader some initiates of Freemasonry are required to take the, quote, oath of, em of Nimrod, unquote. Are you beginning to connect the dots on this? The oath of Nimrod is part of the initiation process for the, quote, indentured apprentice, unquote, which is the first degree of Freemasonry. The oath reads as follows, apprentice degree first, I, and then there's a place for the uh, apprentice's name do in the presence of El Shaddai and of this worshipful assembly of Freemasons, Rough Masons, Wallers, Slaters, Paviors, Plasterers, and Bricklayers promise and declare that I will not at any time hereafter by any act or circumstance whatsoever directly or indirectly write print, cut, mark, publish, discover, reveal, or make known any parts of the trade secrets, privileges, or counsels of the worshipful fraternity or fellowship of Freemasonry, which I may have known at any time, or at any time hereafter, shall be made known unto me. The penalty for breaking this great oath shall be the loss of my life that I shall be branded with the mark of the traitor and slain according to ancient custom by being throttled, that my body shall be buried in the rough sands of the sea a cable's length from the shore where the tide regularly ebbs and flows twice in the twenty-four hours, so that my soul shall have no rest by night or by day. And then the candidate signs his name and that's the end of the oath. Freemasonry spread quickly after the establishment of the first formal lodge in 1717, and by the late 1700s, this front organization had become well known for their good and charitable works, being viewed with favor by the general public, a la the Templars and Rosicrucians, remember. With a formal organization for their millennia-old back plan back in the public eye, the Luciferians were again free to aggressively pursue their ambition of taking over the world. For the vast majority of, of Masons, Freemasonry is a continuous parade of deceptions. Most lodge leaders do not realize that they are deceiving their members. For the most part, they are simply reciting the same things they have heard and said over and over, assuming that they are right and good. However, the upper echelon deliberately deceives the Masons under them. Most men who join have no idea that their initiations consist of solemn blood oaths with implic implications of their death if they reveal any secrets. Masons do in fact take blood oaths, but are told that they are only symbolic, being part of tradition. They participate in rituals that they don't understand the meaning of assuming that they must be all right because their other Masonic friends have done it. Quote, Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. There must always be a commonplace interpretation for the mass of initiates, 
of the symbols that are eloquent to the adepts, 33rd degree masons or higher, unquote. Morals and Dogma, Albert Pike. Simply put, Freemasonry is an organized organization within an organization. One part of the organization is deliberately lied to and misled with false interpretations and only exists as a facade to the general public. The lower level Masons think they are working for a just and honorable cause, while the other part of the organization, the upper echelon, knows the spiritual truth of Freemasonry and its origin and goals, the great plan. Freemasonry at its highest level is a religion. It is the modern day incarnation of the Babylonian mystery religion of King Nimrod and Queen Semiramis. Masons meet in temples, such as the Scottish Rite Temple. They have an altar and there is a holy book on it. They have prayers, deacons, and religious titles for their leaders, such as high priest and worshipful master. They say that they bring men from spiritual darkness to spiritual light. Although Freemasonry is in fact a religion, most Masons deny this fact because they simply don't know the truth of the great plan. One of the requirements of being a Mason is belief in a, sup a supreme being. They just don't tell you which God they really worship at the pinnacle of leadership when you first join, which again is Lucifer. Once a man makes it through the first three Freemasonic rites, he becomes a Master Mason and is eligible to join the Scottish Rite or the York Rite. It is mainly contained within the upper echelon of the Scottish Rite, the ultimate secrets of the Great Plan. I believe that it, it is called the Scottish Rite because that is allegedly where the persecuted Knights Templars fled after the unholy Roman Empire moved to quash them. Squ Scottish Rite Masonry has 29 more degrees after Master Mason. Each of these degrees includes initiation with a blood oath. A 32nd degree Mason is a man who reached the third degree Master Mason in his local lodge and then went through 29 more degrees in the Scottish Rite to attain the title of, quote, Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret, unquote. Now I wonder just what the Royal Secret could be. Once a Scottish Rite Mason reaches the top of the pyramid in Freemasonry, they are eligible to become a 33rd degree Freemason. This level of Masonry is by invite only from those Masons who are already 33rd, 33rd degree or higher. Keep in mind that the 33rd degree is only the first of the Luciferian degrees and the occult ladder goes much higher. Membership initiation into the 33rd degree allegedly includes drinking wine, symbolic of blood, out of a human skull, and taking a solemn oath that their primary allegiance is to the other 33rd degree Masons and those Masons above them in rank, whose allegiance is to Lucifer. Another outgrowth of the Freemasonic Circle is an organization in the United States called Skull and Bones. This is a private fraternity of sorts, based at Yale University, and is the proving grounds for Americans who wish to work for the Great Plan. Also referred to as the, quote, American Illuminati, unquote, the full name of the organization is the, quote, Skull and Bones Brotherhood of Death, unquote. Sounds like a wholesome group, right? No, I suppose not. Their membership parallels and overlaps that of the 33rd degree Masons in terms of their placement in government and business. It is my opinion some of the members of Skull and Bones are also 33rd degree Masons, but since they don't call these things secret societies for nothing, information about this has not been forthcoming. Nonetheless, some of the Skull and Bonesmen are virtually on equal footing with the 33rd degree Masons in terms of the Great Plan pecking order. We'll go over Skull and Bones in more detail shortly. So, in 1992, it was Skull and Bonesman George Bush Sr. versus alleged 33rd degree Freemason Bill Clinton for the Presidency of the United States. In 1996, you had alleged 
33rd degree Freemason Bob Dole against alleged 33rd degree Freemason Bill Clinton. Next it was Skull and Bonesman George W. Bush versus alleged 33rd degree Freemason Al Gore. Then it was Skull and Bonesman Bush versus Skull and Bonesman John Kerry. Are you understanding this? We don't select or elect any of our presidents. They are handpicked and groomed for the job years in advance according to their membership status in the Luciferian secret societies and their willingness to follow the agenda of the Great Plan. I need to again address the use of the term alleged 33rd degree Freemason. Freemasons have a habit of not airing their secrets in public under threat of death, including who is a member of the upper echelon of Freemasonry. What I do know is that you do not have to rise up the ranks of Freemasonry to become a 33rd degree. You can have ranks 1 to 32 bestowed upon you in a single ceremony, and then take the 33rd degree initiation. Doing it this way subverts years of involvement in the lodges and therefore minimizes the exposure of the most important Freemasons to other low-level Masons who might confirm these people's involvement with Freemasonry. This is how I believe they keep a lid on who the 33rd degree Masons are. Masonic prophets like Albert Pike, Manley P. Hall, and the like have no problem publicly stating that they are 33rd degree Masons and the fact that they worship the entity Lucifer, as you will soon see. But to have a sitting president who is publicly known as a 33rd degree Freemason would endanger, endanger their program. Quote, Masonry, like all the religions, all the mysteries, conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and sages, or the elect and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve only to be misled. Truth is not for those who are unworthy or unable to receive it or, or would pervert it." Unquote. Albert Pike, 33rd degree Freemason from his occult masterpiece, Morals and Dogma. If I ever had the resources to fully investigate various claims of our elected officials' status as 33rd degree Freemasons, I certainly would. Regardless of what rank of Freemasonry, if any, of the people on the list below, their true intentions are betrayed regardless of their position on the religious end of the Great Plan through Freemasonry. Most of our elected senators, congressmen, Supreme Court just justices, and everybody on the President's Council, including the President, hold membership cards in one or more of the various roundtable steering groups we'll go over later in this book. These steering groups were factually started and controlled today by the Masters of the Great Plan. Here is a list commonly found on the Internet of famous 33rd degree Freemasons. There is strong evidence that some of these men are of the 33rd degree, and some I can find nary a clue to their status in Freemasonry. Again, detailed investigations into the backgrounds of these and other people who are deciding how we are going to live our lives should be initiated immediately to determine their status, if any, within Freemasonry, also known as King Nimrod's Luciferian Great Plan. Okay, here's the list. Founding Father George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Paul Warburg, founder of the Federal Reserve, Al Gore, Newt Gingrich, President Clinton, President Gerald Ford, President Lyndon Baines Johnson, President Harry Truman, President Franklin, Franklin D. Roosevelt, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, Joseph Stalin, and then we got in parentheses, yes, the above three who led the Allies in World War II were all alleged 33rd degree Freemasons. British Prime Minister Tony Blair, Aleister Crowley, self-confessed Satanist, Walt Disney, occult themes in kids' movies, started Club 33, a secret Masonic club located on the Disneyland property 
and the only place in the quote magic kingdom unquote that serves booze. Filmmaker James Cameron, Reverend Jesse Jackson, Karl Marx, H.G. Wells, on and on and on. There are degrees above the 33rd and these are reserved for the most advanced occultists, those who are master practitioners of black magic, etc. We'll talk briefly about those degrees when we get to talking about a name, a man named Aleister Crowley, nicknamed the most evil man of the 20th century. One more thing to talk about that is central to both the great plan Freemasonry and what is stated in biblical prophecy to happen right before the end times, and that is the rebuilding of Solomon's temple in Israel. It is their intention to gain control of the Islamic Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which was built atop the ruins of King Solomon's temple. After assuming control of this highly coveted piece of land, they will demolish the Islamic Temple and rebuild Solomon's Temple. According to biblical prophecy, once the temple is rebuilt, the Masonic Christ, better known as the Antichrist, who you now know as a resurrected King Nimrod, will make his appearance and the ultimate hell on earth will follow. King Solomon was quite the interesting character and again is highly revered by the Freemasons not only because he built the prophetic temple that he transformed into an occult temple, but because of his masterful power in the occult circles of the day. Part of his life was spent honoring the Most High God and part of it was spent paying homage to the pagan gods of his many foreign wives, which is the following of Nimrod's Babylonian mystery religion, and by default is worship of Lucifer. Solomon is credited by occultists with mastering the use of the, quote, seal of Solomon, unquote, for occult ceremonies, which is the most powerful esoteric symbol in black magic witchcraft, and also known as a hexagram. This is where the term putting a, quote, hex, unquote, on someone comes from. You're using a hexagram in an occult ceremony to request the supernatural forces to interact in our dimension and cause someone harm. You may also know this symbol better as the, quote, Star of David, unquote, which adorns the modern day Israeli flag. Symbols such as the hexagram originated in occult black magic circles and can be renamed but not repurposed. The very reason that symbols such as the hexagram or pentagram, a five-sided star, also a black magic symbol, are in existence, are in existence was because they were or originally used millennia ago during occult rituals to interact with, quote, demons, unquote. These symbols serve the same evil purposes today, only covertly. The term, Star of David, is an intentional deception by the masters of the Great Plan and has nothing to do with King David. Before it was repurposed at the Star of David, it was called the St Seal of Solomon. The use of the hexagram, in fact, actually predates King Solomon and what was originally known as the Star of Raphaim, which is representative of the worship of the planet Saturn. Tracing the origin of the hexagram even farther back, and it appears that it originally was a symbol representing King Nimrod. The fact that the Luciferian occult symbol for the Antichrist is on the Israeli flag today is a red flag, betraying who is really running not only Israel these days, but the world. The Star of David has nothing to do with Judaism and everything to do with the occult and the great plan of Nimrod. The hexagram is arguably the most influ influential and powerful occult symbol in the world. In fact, it is so significant that the synagogue of Satan bloodline, who largely controls the world's money supply today, the European Rothschilds, took their name directly from it. Their name is the literal translation of the symbol of the occult hexagram. Meyer Amschel Bauer, the patriarch of the Rothschild banking dynasty, changed his last name in the 17th century to depict the red hexagram star or shield, 
which he had hung as his identifying symbol on the front door of his goldsmith shop in Germany. This marked the beginning of the family of, quote, Red Shield, unquote, or Rothschild. The Rothschilds are the heads of both the Synagogue of Satan and the Great Plan today, and their name is synonymous with the hexagram, and this is why there is a hexagram on the flag of Israel today. It is by direct action of the Rothschild family that Israel came back into existence and we will go over the facts of this and you will see this to be the truth. The hexagram is also the official insignia of the Freemasons today, although veiled. By removing the horizontal lines of the hexagram, you are left with a near perfect image of the positioning of the Freemasonic square and compass. This follows along per perfectly with the Great Plan's use of symbols to mean one thing to most people. But to the adepts of the Great Plan, that same symbol has a completely different and esoteric meaning. The unfinished Freemasonic symbol of the hexagram, also known as the symbol of Nimrod, directly symbolizes both the unfinished Great Plan, also represented by a pyramid sans capstone, and the unfinished Temple of Solomon, the future seat of the resurrected Nimrod. Once the New World Order is firmly established and the Temple of Solomon rebuilt, it will be time for the Antichrist Apollyon Nimrod to make his appearance and take his throne once again. It is also highly probable that the hexagram is representative of the Mark of the Beast. The number 666 can easily be extracted from the geometry of the hexagram. The mark of the beast has to do with commerce according to the Bible, and this mark is today on nearly every product you buy and you don't even know it. Go right now to your cupboard and grab a box of cereal, a bottle of water, or any packaged product, which pretty much encompasses anything you would buy these days. Look on it for the recycling emblem, the three arrows forming a pyramid shape. Look very carefully at the center of this pyramid. Do you see the hexagram? Although there are slight variations, the original recycle emblems create a perfect hexagram in the center. This is why it was selected over all competing designs and was very possibly planted to appear to be a coincidence. All other recycling emblems are based on this original design, incorporating a hexagram in the middle. This is an intentional marking of the products you buy today with the Mark of the Beast, Nimrod. I've got two more loose ends to throw in here as we wrap up our brief discussion of Freemasonry. It again has to do <clears throat> with our space program, which was the pinnacle of our advanced knowledge at the time. The single runway at Kennedy Space Center in Florida is called Runway 33 where the Apollo Moon missions and the first Space Shuttle Columbia launched from. Also, alleged 33rd degree Mason and second man on the moon, Buzz Aldrin, factually claimed the moon for the Freemasons in an occult ceremony he performed by himself while he was standing on the moon. Google it. You'll be amazed. Okay, well that's the <clears throat> end of that chapter. And I'm sure that this uh, the title alone will draw in some uh, some uh, friendly Freemasons to uh, help help us see the light here that uh, really we're on the wrong track. But uh, I expect that. And again, I would highly recommend that uh, if you haven't already, or, or to at least put put it in the back of your mind. If not, just go ahead and start finding the the series by William Cooper about the mysteries and um, it goes into a lot more detail about a lot of this stuff and so that's it for this one and uh, appreciate it and we'll talk to you next time